Good evening. Welcome to our midweek online worship service. We're so glad that you're here as we've gathered together to worship the Lord in song, praise Him with thanksgiving, and then open His Word together. We're going to be continuing tonight our study through the book of Isaiah, and we're in Isaiah chapter 54. So if you could grab your Bible, have it ready, open to chapter 54, and after we worship, we'll get right into the Word together. So, uh, looking forward to gathering together again in person, and Sundays we're going to be utilizing our outside amphitheater, so looking forward to being back together. Uh, if you want to know details about when and how we're meeting again, uh, please make sure you're on our email list. Uh, send us your email if you're not getting emails from us. We're using email to communicate the details about our regathering together. So please make sure you send us your email. Also, if you consider Calvary Chapel of Delta your home church, we have a private Facebook group that we also utilize to communicate about the things that are happening around the church. Uh, we're praying. We're continuing to pray for the Lord to lead and guide, unify and direct, and empower us to reach others with the gospel of Jesus Christ. People need to hear about the hope that we have in him. And now is the time for us to be faithful ambassadors, to communicate the gospel with clarity and passion. So please join us as we pray. Uh, we're so thankful for those of you that are praying. And we're doing different things to encourage prayer. One of the new things that we're doing is every day of the week, Monday through Friday at noon, we have an hour of prayer on a Zoom meeting. You can call into that Zoom meeting if you have 10 minutes on your lunch break or you'd like to stay for the whole hour. We have people praying. There are so many things that we need to be praying about. There are people that are sick, people that are struggling, people that are struggling financially. Uh, we can pray for the Lord to drive this virus away, for the Lord to give wisdom to our leaders, for the Lord to empower us to be his witnesses. So we really hope that people will gather together in Jesus' name and come before the throne of grace, asking him to give us our help, help in our time of need. So if you want to be a part of that, again, make sure you're on our email list or a private Facebook group where information is posted about those very important prayer meetings. Well, if you're on Facebook tonight, it's a great time right now to share this service or to start a watch party. When you start a watch party, it lets all your friends know that you're watching and gives them an opportunity to join us. So it might give them an exposure to the word that they wouldn't otherwise have had. Um, also, if you're on Facebook or YouTube or on our website, it's a great time to just say hello, let others know you're watching, you're listening, you're worshiping tonight. Uh, it's good to know that you're not alone. So just take a moment and use that chat feature to say hello. Uh, normally we can greet each other. Can't do that face to face right now, but uh, just a, a neat way to, to show people that they're not alone as we've gathered electronically tonight. All right, let's uh, prepare our hearts for the word, let's continue with worship as we sing praise to him. Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to this time of worship and study of God's word. Let's pray before we start. Lord God, we thank you so much that you're here with us. Um, I pray that you would speak to us through your word, that we would be focused on you during worship. Um, that we would worship you and praise you with everything because you are worthy of it, Lord. We're declaring your worth. Thank you that you're here with us, even in the midst of um, everything going on around us, that you're still here and you're still ready to teach us. We thank you in your name. Um, so this first song that we're going to do is um, a song that's really been ministering to me lately, and um, it's new, but I wanted to read from James chapter 5 um, to kind of explain the theme behind it. In James chapter 5, it says, Therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rain. 
You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. My brethren, take the prophets, who spoke in the name of the Lord, as an example of suffering and patience. Indeed, we count them blessed to endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job, and seen the end, in, end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. So, um, that's kind of the theme of this song. darkness we were waiting without hope and without light so from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in
to reveal the kingdom come and to reconcile the lost to redeem the whole creation you did not despise the cross for even in your suffering you saw to the other side knowing this was our salvation jesus for our sakes the king of kings the lord of lords you're so powerful you're so mighty you've done so much lord god we praise you you are worthy
you we know that your intentions your plans for us are good and that you love us we trust that you want to speak to us tonight please um, open up our ears and our hearts please help us to hear from you please teach us please help us to love you more lord god and to learn more about you and to know you just lord god please help us in your name amen Let's open our Bibles to Isaiah chapter 54 as we continue through God's Word together tonight, Isaiah 54. And with our Bibles open, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your Word. We thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit. We thank you, Lord, for your abiding love for us, for your faithfulness. We're thankful, Lord, that you're our shield, our rock, our strong tower. We're thankful, Lord, that we can run to you and find refuge and strength, peace and hope. And I pray that you would please speak to us tonight from your word and that all who are listening will have ears to hear what your spirit is saying to your church. We thank you, Lord. We commit this time to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. In Isaiah 53, the Lord, through Isaiah, prophetically put before us his servant, his suffering servant. He was despised and rejected. He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. He suffered to secure peace for us. He took the punishment that we deserve, as the Lord laid on him what we deserve for our iniquity, that is our perversity, or our twisted lives. His soul, not just his physical life, but his soul was made an offering for our sin. And it was his choice, it was not against his will, as we were told in Isaiah 53, that he chose to pour out his soul unto death. Yes, Isaiah 53, written 700 years before Jesus was even born, gives us 
a detailed prophetic description of his experience. And not only that, but it provides a prophetic explanation for the reason for his suffering and death. Now, the context of the prophecy indicates that Isaiah 53 will be the confession of the remnant of the people of Israel who are believing at the end of the tribulation, just before Jesus returns. The people who, according to Romans chapter 11, were broken off due to unbelief, but will be grafted back in as they put their faith in Jesus as their Messiah, as their Savior. They'll realize the mistake of their forefathers, and they'll repent and be converted, and their sins will be blotted out so that times of refreshing can come as Jesus returns and restores all things. The Lord Jesus did the work on the cross to remove sin, to provide peace, to justify sinners, to establish a spiritual family, and to provide an eternal reward for us. Nothing can be added to the work of redemption, his all-sufficient work that he did on the cross. We can't improve upon that. Chapter 54 flows out of that truth, the truth of the work of God's servant, Jesus Christ. And chapter 24 invites a response. It encourages those who have confessed faith in God's servant, Jesus Christ, and encourages us to gain or obtain his perspective, to have his mind, to think about the things that happen and have happened and will happen in our lives the way he thinks about them. So let's take a look together at this encouraging chapter. Chapter 54 and verse 1, where the Lord through Isaiah says, Sing, O barren, you who have not borne, Break forth into singing and cry aloud, you who have not labored with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married woman, says the Lord. Now, the Lord in Scripture sets before us several women, barren, unable to conceive, who the Lord worked for supernaturally to open their wombs and to give them children, beginning with Sarah Abraham's wife, and then, of course, Rebecca, Hannah, Elizabeth. You have several of these examples where the Lord works supernaturally to open the womb of a woman and give her a child. Now, in the case of Sarah, when the Lord chose Abraham, he promised that Abraham would be a great nation. Abraham and Sarah were older, even at that time, and they had not been able to have children. And so hearing that he would be a great nation was an amazing promise. In Genesis chapter 15, as the years moved on, the Lord affirmed the promise and made it clear to Abraham that from his body would come his heir. And then again in Genesis chapter 17, the Lord affirmed his promise and emphasized that Abraham and Sarah would together have a child. And yet it wasn't until Sarah was 90 and Abraham was 100 that the promise began to be fulfilled as Isaac was born. For a while, most of their married lives, in fact, if you simply looked at Sarah's experience and you just observed it and you came to logical conclusions, it seems like she was missing out. Uh, What Sarah and Abraham attempted to have children led to no fruit, no offspring. And she was barren long enough to establish the fact that there was no way humanly possible for her to conceive. But she had God's promise, and eventually God worked in a supernatural way on her behalf and gave her great reason to rejoice as she and Abraham saw the fulfillment of God's promises and God worked in a way that was way beyond any human possibility. By the way, and this is just something on a side to note, it's interesting. If you study Galatians chapter 4, you'll see that 
Paul used this verse, Isaiah 54, verse 1, along with a comparison between Hagar and Sarah to emphasize the blessing of God's grace and the mess that we make when we attempt to obtain God's promises by our own works and own efforts. But here in the context, this is an encouragement to repentant Israel who will come through the tribulation, who will be looking back at their lives and be struggling and, and discouraged because although they were blessed with the promise as a people, they'll be looking at that time back with regret, thinking about their failures and how they failed to produce spiritual children. They'll think, well, we really blew it. We were given so much. We were privileged people. And yet we failed to receive Jesus until now. And we failed to be productive for him. Spiritually barren. And the Lord will say to them, Sing, O barren. You have more spiritual children than you know about. That's what Paul explains in Romans chapter 11 when he wrote explaining that even after Israel rejected Jesus, uh, the Lord was working and he brought salvation to the Gentiles. That in fact, Israel's rejection of the gospel was repurposed by the Lord to bring the gospel to us so that we as Gentiles could be reconciled to God. If you look at the apostles and how they first went to synagogues to preach the gospel, and then they were rejected in the synagogues in town after town by their own brethren, and that moved them out to focus on reaching the Gentiles. Uh, Romans chapter 11, verse 12, Paul wrote concerning Israel. Romans 11, verse 12, that their fall is riches for the world and their failure riches for the Gentiles. How much more their fullness. So with Israel, after having suffered so much for rejecting Jesus Christ and perhaps even thinking, you know, if we only had come to Christ earlier, if we only had not rejected him, you know, and looking at their lives with regret. And the Lord answers them here by pointing them to all those who come to faith during their days of desolation, pointing them essentially to us, to the church. And the Lord will say to them, rejoice. I was working in your barrenness. I was working even when you couldn't see. Truly, he has used Israel, even in their rejection, to bring us to new birth to bring us forth into the family of God. Israel, even in their rejection, became a testimony, an evidence of God's faithfulness to do exactly what he said he would do. So the remnant of Israel will sort of be like Joseph's brothers, who were truly concerned when their father died. Uh, they were living with regret in their lives over their treatment of Joseph. And they sent to Joseph and begged for forgiveness. And Joseph responded to them in Genesis chapter 50 and verse 20. Genesis 50 and verse 20. And he said, but as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as this day to save many people alive. In a similar manner, the Lord will say to Israel, sing, O barren. Sing, O barren, break forth into singing and cry aloud. You have not labored with child for more of the children of the desolate than the children of the married woman, says the Lord. He'll show them all the children the Lord brought forth them. He'll, he'll show them that he saved many people through the period of their historic rejection. It's interesting, when you get to Revelation chapter 21, there's a description of our heavenly home, the New Jerusalem. And there in that description, it says that on the gates, there'll be 12 gates, and on the gates, there'll be the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. And so every time that we enter in and we go out of that place that will be our eternal home, we'll be reminded that we came to Christ through Israel, through their testimony, through the work he did on their behalf, that God used Israel to get a hold of our lives, that we have a, a spiritual heritage through the people of Israel. So here he'll encourage them. Yes, you failed. Yes, you had a, a time of desolation. But look what I did through you. You know, perhaps tonight you're listening and you have regrets. Maybe you're looking back on your life and thinking, well, what if, it, what if I came to Christ earlier? Or what if I hadn't backslidden? Or what if I hadn't been so foolish and made that mistake? 
The Lord wants you to know tonight that he's been working in ways that you cannot see. And he has a way of repurposing our failures and even using them to advance his plan. You know, he would say to us, sing, O Baron, that he's working, he's doing something. So this exhortation, this encouragement to Israel continues in verse 2. He says to them, enlarge the place of your tent and let them stretch out the curtains of your dwellings. Do not spare, lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes. For you shall expand to the right and to the left and your descendants will inherit the nations and make the desolate cities inhabited. Now living in a tent, living in a tent meant living out from under any external threats. If there was an invasion, you'd want to live in a walled city. A tent provides shelter, privacy, but not much protection. But protection won't be needed when Jesus returns. And Israel will be experiencing that, that kind of life of safety and security. And they will fully inhabit their promised possession that was promised to Abraham. They'll inherit territory from the Euphrates to the Nile. They'll have to enlarge their tents because the number of their descendants will multiply in the kingdom age. So he's encouraging them as they're moving forward with him. Well, the Lord continued in verse 4. He said, Do not fear, for you will not be ashamed, neither be disgraced, for you will not be put to shame. For I will forget the shame, or you will forget the shame of your youth and will not remember the reproach of your widowhood anymore. For your maker is your husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, and your redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. He is called the God of the whole earth. For the Lord has called you like a woman forsaking and grieved in spirit, like a youthful wife when you were refused, says your God. So here the Lord was addressing their feelings, their feelings of, of fear, shame, disgrace, reproach, even feelings of being destitute, alone, upset, rejected, speaking of Israel as a woman in different situations, dealing with the shame of the past, like a woman dealing with the disgrace of barrenness, for in the ancient world, people would often think that if you didn't have children, God must have determined that you were unworthy to have children. So he describes them as having to deal with those kind of feelings of being unworthy or, or feelings of shame from the things that they've done in the past. He addressed them as a widow who was dealing with the pain, the hurt, the, the worry of being left alone. Now he described them as, a, as a, their feelings as the feelings of a young woman being rejected, being left by her husband. And he used that kind of description for them. And he said to them, look, you don't have to fear. You won't be put to shame. You'll forget your failures of the past. Why? He said, for your maker is your husband, the Lord of hosts. In other words, their comfort will be found in their relationship with the Lord. He made them their maker. He, he chose them to be his own. He who has more power than anyone, the Lord of hosts, he redeemed them. He purchased them. He paid for them. And he has authority over all the earth. He's the God of all the earth. And when he called them, he knew how they would fail. I hope you realize tonight that the Lord knew all about your failures. He knew all about your faithfulness, unfaithfulness. He knew all about the shameful things that you did. He knew all that when he called you. He knows all about you and he chose you. He chose you uh, knowing all about who you are. He chose to save you, to pay for your failures, to redeem you. You have nothing to fear. There's not going to be anything in your life that's a surprise to him. You're not going to be ashamed. You're not going to be disgraced. 
If you placed your faith in Jesus, you have nothing to be ashamed of. There's nothing that's in your past that will come back to bite you. He knew everything about you before he chose you. And now that you've come to faith in him, he's washed it all away. He loves you. And he's committed to you. And that's where you find peace. That's where you find security. That's where you find rest. He wants you to be secure in that relationship of love, that covenant relationship with him. As symbolically he said here, your maker is your husband. Well, he continued to speak to them, this remnant of Israel, along the same line of thought. Look at verse 7. He said, for a mere moment I have forsaken you, but with great mercy I will gather you. With a little wrath, I hid my face from you for a moment. But with everlasting kindness, I will have mercy on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. Question. When did the Lord forsake Israel? He says here, for a mere moment, I have forsaken you. Well, the Spirit of God came upon Azariah when he went to meet King Asa in 2 Chronicles 15.2. And he said this. This helps us understand this concept. 2 Chronicles chapter 15, verse 2. He said, The Lord is with you while you are with him. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. Now, the ultimate forsaking of the Lord was when the leaders of Israel delivered Jesus to Pilate and demanded his crucifixion. Because of Israel's rejection of Jesus, in Jesus' words, he said to them, See, your house is left to you desolate. Because of your choice, Matthew 23, 38. I wanted to gather you, but you rejected me. See, your house is left to you desolate. And that happened almost 2,000 years ago. And yet here as the Lord is speaking to his people, he described it as a mere moment. They through unbelief were cut off. And in the Lord's eyes, it, was, it has been just a mere moment. Similarly, the Lord says here, and with a little wrath, that he hid his face from Israel. And again, the little wrath that they'll experience is yet to come on the earth, the coming time of tribulation, the time known as Jacob's trouble. If you read the description of that time of wrath, it's going to be horrible. The worst time ever on planet earth, unprecedented difficulty on the earth. Read Zechariah chapter 13, Zechariah chapter 14, and the word says there that in Israel, two-thirds of the people will be cut off. Two-thirds will die. And the survivors in Jerusalem, one-half of them will be taken captive. Read Revelation chapter 6 through 19. It describes this time of wrath, war all over the earth, shortages, scarcity, over half the population killed through War, through global pandemics, uh, vegetation being burned up, water being polluted, undrinkable. Uh, then great earthquakes, cities falling flats, mountains moving, islands disappearing, 75-pound hailstones falling from heaven. And then for Israel, on top of it, a great time of persecution. And here, the Lord in the book of Isaiah looks down upon that, looks, looks at that event, and he says, it's a little wrath. It's a little wrath. It's as if he'll be glancing away as it's going on. Just a little wrath. A mere moment. A little wrath. But here he sets it in the light of his great mercy. He makes a comparison. His everlasting kindness. You know, verse 7, he says, For a mere moment I have forsaken you, but great mercies I will gather you. With a little wrath I have hid my face from you for a moment. But with everlasting kindness I will have mercy on you, says the Lord your Redeemer. Similar to Psalm 30, verse 5. Psalm 30, verse 5 says, For his anger is but for a moment, but his favor is for life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. 
This is sort of an Old Testament, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 17 to 18. 2 Corinthians 4, 17 to 18, where Paul the Apostle wrote, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. The Lord will make sure that his people know that the trouble they experienced, the difficulty that they endured, we, although it seems huge for them, is nothing compared to the mercy and kindness that they will experience. That his compassion on his people, his unending, loving kindness, so far outweigh the difficulty that they've gone through. His purpose for leaving them and allowing them to experience a little of his anger was to bring them into the experience of his mercy and kindness that never, ever ends. So for Israel, the time of trouble will be an instrument to, that will bring them to a place where they'll cry out and be saved out of it so that they could experience this eternal kindness, this great mercy that God has always wanted to bestow upon them. The Lord continues in verse 9 to minister to them, again developing this thought. Verse 9, For this is like the waters of Noah to me, for as I have sworn that the waters of Noah would no longer cover the earth, so I have sworn that I would not be angry with you nor rebuke you. Now during the days of Noah, the waters covered the entire earth. The waters were God's judgment upon the earth. And through those waters, that judgment came and the earth was cleansed of its wickedness. And, and life was tough for Noah during those days. He was saved through it. He was preserved through it. But being on that ark you know, for almost a year with all those animals through a terrible storm was no easy journey. Life was tough for Noah, but Noah was preserved. He was saved. He was delivered. In fact, he was delivered through tribulation into a new earth, a cleansed earth, a better place. And then Noah was given the promise that the Lord would never again destroy the earth with a worldwide flood. In fact, we know the Lord hung up his bow in the heavens. Uh, we see it even after it rains today. That bow, the Lord saying, I'm not going to pour out my wrath that way again. Now the tribulation that's coming will be similar. And that's what the Lord is pointing to here. Now, a terrible time of judgment. But the Lord will keep the remnant of Israel as he kept Noah. It will be tough for them, but he'll keep them. And he'll use that process to cleanse the earth. And when it's all over, when it's all done, it will never, ever happen again. It will be over. Like the flood, it will not happen again. And that's what he's communicating here. Verse 10, he said, For the mountains shall depart and the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from you, nor shall my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord who has mercy on you. Literally, every huge and seemingly immovable thing will be shaking, moving. The mountains that you think will always be there, hmm, they'll all be moving, shaken. Many will fall flat but the Lord's kindness will not depart. His promise, his covenant that brings peace, that assures shalom, wholeness, well-being, peace, will, will never move. Why is that? Well, remember back in Isaiah 53 in verse 5, the word says, the chastisement for our peace will be upon him upon his suffering servant, upon Jesus. In other words, the discipline, the necessary correction that we needed was placed on him. Jesus took our place. We have peace, enduring peace, this promise of peace, 
because Jesus paid our debt. He settled our unresolved guilt. He served our sentence so that we can have peace with God. We're justified by his blood, those of us who have believed, so now we have peace with God. We have this covenant of peace that's established by him. Now, the old covenant on Mount Sinai that God gave to Israel didn't provide peace. In fact, if you look at that covenant, beginning with the Ten Commandments, it showed man his failures. It showed man his need. And it certainly did point man to God's provision, his acceptance of mediation and a substitutionary atonement or sacrifice. It pointed to God's solution. But it never brought peace. It was conditional, based on man's behavior. If you try to approach God based on your behavior, your performance, your ability to get a, keep a set of rules, you'll never have lasting peace. Oh, you might have some good days, but then you'll have bad days. you have days where you'll think, well, everything's at peace in my heart, everything's at peace with God, and then the next day you'll blow it and you'll lack that peace with the Lord and you'll lack that inner peace. The new covenant, Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34, describes it. The new covenant that Jesus announced, he said, in my blood. In that new covenant, he puts his law in our minds and on our hearts and we enjoy a relationship with him. We all know him. We don't need a priest and we experience his forgiveness, complete forgiveness, and he remembers our sin no more, and it's all based on his work. That's why we can have peace that endures, because it's not based on our performance, it's based on his. The covenant of peace is secure because it's based on his finished work. Everything else can move but his covenant remains. Verse 11 continues. And we need to read this very carefully. O you afflicted one, tossed with tempest and not comforted. If you underline your Bible, write in your Bible, you might want to underline those words, and not comforted. Behold, I will lay your stones with colorful gems and lay your foundations with sapphires. I will make your pinnacles of rubies your gates of crystal, and all your walls of precious stones. This is to those who are afflicted in a storm, but with no relief, no consolation, no comfort. Please note this. Sometimes storms come and we pray and we pray. And we're waiting for the Lord to stand up and say, be still. But the storms continue. Sometimes afflictions continue, even as we pray. Remember, Paul had a thorn in his flesh. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 says that he prayed three times that it would go away. And then the Lord responded and said to him, My grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. And Paul said in response to that, Therefore, most gladly, I would rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ might rest upon me. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 10, 2 Corinthians 12, 10, he went on to write, Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Sometimes, difficulties continue. And we pray and they continue. And we pray and they continue. And God meets us in those difficulties with his grace. But that doesn't mean that you will always find relief here on the earth. Maybe you'll never have relief on this earth. Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10. 1 Peter 5, 10. He said, but may the God of all grace who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus after you have suffered a while perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. 
Listen, some will suffer and not find relief here. We need to remember that there are people that are persecuted for their faith all over the world. And they pray and they seek and they ask and they knock and the persecution continues. Many have given their lives as they've served the Lord. Many have suffered and died. But for those who suffer here and find no relief here, there's a reward ahead. That's what this verse points to. Those who go through a storm and have no comfort. The Lord promises a beautiful mosaic, a valuable foundation, a display of beauty and value and glory ahead. And certainly this echoes or shadows the description of the new city of Jerusalem, our eternal home that's described in Revelation 21. There's a glimpse maybe, maybe of it here. But the primary application here is that affliction with no relief here on earth produces beautiful, valuable, enduring, eternal rewards. In fact, think about this. The difference between a lump of dirt or a lump of clay and a beautiful gem is immense pressure and tremendous heat. You can take the same elements that are common and put them under immense pressure and tremendous heat and suddenly you have a precious gem. Look, God does beautiful things in our lives as we experience his grace in our affliction. He does beautiful things. He produces in us things that we could never produce ourselves through pressure, through when life heats up. He produces in us things that radiate his glory, things that reflect his light, things that add value to our lives eternally. The, the character of Christ is produced in our lives so others can see him. It's true. Things that are far more valuable than some momentary relief. He produces eternal, eternal good. And it will be true in those of the remnant of Israel who go through the tribulation this coming. And look at this promise for them. Verse 13, he says to them, All your children shall be taught by the Lord, and great shall be the peace of your children. Now Micah chapter 4, verses 1 to 2, says this of the kingdom age. Uh, the millennial age, the thousand-year reign of Christ that's coming on the earth, the time when the Lord answers that prayer, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Micah chapter 4, verses 1 to 2, says this, Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and peoples shall flow to it. Many nations shall come and say, Come, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of God of Jacob, he, he will teach us his ways. He will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his path. For out of Zion the law shall go forth, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Listen, Jesus will be in Jerusalem teaching Bible studies. And not just to the adults. Here we see he will teach their children. Literally, he'll be doing children's ministry, the best children's ministry ever. And the result of the Lord teaching, please notice, will be peace. The teaching of the word of God will result in peace. And today it's true. The teaching of the word of God should result in peace, shalom, wholeness, peace, no conflict with God, no inner conflict going on. That's the, the results that come as the word of God is being taught because his word reveals his love. His word reveals his sovereignty. His word reveals his faithfulness. His word reveals his plan, his power, his way, his salvation. The word of God builds our faith. His word feeds us spiritually, and the result of all of that should be peace. His word helps us to focus our minds on him, and there's peace there. Remember back in Isaiah 26, verse 3? Isaiah 26, verse 3, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Get our minds on him. Keep our minds on him, and he'll give us peace. Do you want your children to have peace? 
Are your children anxious right now with all the changes and the uncertainty and the fear? If you want your children to have peace, teach them the Word of God and help them develop a personal relationship with the Lord. That's where there is peace. Well, the Lord will do that for Israel and the kingdom age. He'll teach their children. And the Lord continues this encouragement in verse 14. He says to them, In righteousness you shall be established. You shall be far from oppression, for you shall not fear. And from terror, for it shall not come near you. <laughs> That's a word for Israel. They love to experience. And again, this is in the kingdom and the thousand-year reign of Christ that the Bible says so much about. Righteousness will prevail. Jesus will be reigning in righteousness. Israel will not be oppressed. There will be no terrorism that they have to worry about. And they'll be enjoying that great blessing. As Jesus is reigning, things will be made right. Really right. Not to please a political party. Not to win an election. But he's king and things will be right. And people will be freed from their fears. Fear won't keep people captive. There'll be absolute security with Jesus reigning. That's what the kingdom will be like. Now, today, we can experience these things some measure in our lives as we enthrone Jesus in our lives. If he's ruling and reigning, he has begun a process of making you right in your experience, in changing you and making you more and more right. Positionally, you're right before God, but he's making your life more and more righteous as he reigns. And he's seeking to set you free from your fears, and he wants you to be secure. But this here in the text is speaking of a literal time for Israel. When Jesus returns, we return with him. He conquers his enemies and fulfills his promises to Israel and establishes his throne. Look at verse 15. Indeed, they shall surely assemble, but not because of me. Whoever assembles against you shall fall for your sake. Now, throughout various times in history, the Lord assembled Israel's enemies against them. Even in the days of Isaiah, they'd experienced it with Assyria. The Lord drew Assyria to Israel to discipline them. And then later, we know Isaiah even prophesied of how the Lord would draw Babylon to discipline them again. But here the Lord is indicating that there will be an assembly that won't be because of him. And that assembly against Israel that's not because of him will fail. These are the words of the Lord preparing his people for what will happen at the end of the millennial reign. Revelation 20, 7 to 10 says this. Revelation 20, 7 to 10. Now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle whose number is of the sand of the sea. They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. That's what's coming at the end of the millennial reign. And here in Isaiah 54, the Lord was preparing his people for that event. And he says there's going to be this gathering and this attack that will not be because of me. And as they come, it will fail. They won't succeed. The Lord continued in verse 16. He said, Behold, I have created the blacksmith who blows the coals in the fire, who brings forth an instrument for his work, and I have created the spoiler to destroy. Now, the Lord is sovereign. And here he's developing that idea that he is sovereign. He creates people who use created things to create things for their own use or purposes. Here, a blacksmith, that's a created person who uses a created thing, fire, to create a thing, a tool, that he'll use 
in his work. That's the illustration. The blacksmith, a created man, can take a fire, a hot fire to make it, to use it to make something that will be useful in his work. And if a man can do that, then the Lord can create a spoiler to destroy. And the spoiler can think that he's doing his own thing, but actually the Lord has a purpose even in the life of the spoiler or the destroyer. So here he's communicating that there's a purpose, a plan, a design behind the things that he does. And he's the one that sets limits for the destroyer, as he will at the end of the millennial reign, when he brings the attack of the enemy to an end. The Lord's in charge. He's sovereign. That's what he's communicating. And today he, he sets limits for our lives, um, protects us. Look at verse 17. And this is a very f- famous, well-known verse. Verse 17. No weapon formed against you shall prosper, and every tongue which rises against you in judgment you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is from me, says the Lord. Now, if you're a servant of the Lord, this is your heritage. This is your incontestable right. It's something that is yours. Just as much as your righteousness is from him. Now, back in Isaiah 53, the word says that Jesus took the punishment for our sins our iniquity. On the other side of that equation, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says, he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Romans 3, 21 and 22 puts it this way. Romans 3, 21 and 22. But now the righteousness apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. So if you believe in Jesus Christ, God has made you righteous. You are righteous in God's sight, regardless of your past failures. Jesus' righteousness has been counted as yours. You as a servant have been given that righteous standing from the Lord. And you have this heritage that's described here, that no weapon, and that word weapon could be translated instrument, vessel, equipment, object, anything that's fashioned, that's created as a a vessel, as an implement, that weapon that's formed against you, that's fashioned against you, not one will prosper. And that word prosper means it will not be successful. It will not advance over you. Again, if you're a servant of the Lord, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. Now, don't get this wrong. You hear people quoting this and, and communicating the wrong idea. This does not mean that you'll never get sick. It doesn't mean that you can look at the virus that's going around right now and say, well, no weapon formed against me will prosper, that this virus is a weapon formed against me and it's not going to make me sick. It doesn't mean that you'll never get ripped off. It doesn't mean that you'll never be beat up, abused, or, or neglected, or, or hurt. It doesn't mean that you'll never be falsely accused or condemned. This does not mean that you'll never be a victim of someone else's selfish agenda. This does not mean that you'll never be injured or never be killed. This does not mean that you'll escape COVID-19. No weapon formed against me will prosper. No, this means that ultimately nothing formed against you will be successful or advance over you. And this is your incontestable right, your possession, your heritage from the Lord. This means, for example, that if you're robbed or ripped off on the earth, as a servant of the Lord, you have treasure laid up in heaven where no thief can break in and steal. You have a secure treasure in heaven, and you have a Father who's who's promised to provide for all of your needs. 
This means that someone may kill you. But 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8, 2 Corinthians 5, 8 says we are confident, yes, well, pleased rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. This means that you're more than a conqueror. This means that no matter what happens, you can be confident in Romans chapter 8, verses 28 and 29. Romans 8, 28 and 29, and we know that all things work together for good for those that love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. This means that everything that's happening, God is taking it and orchestrating it and using it, like a blacksmith uses a fire, like a blacksmith makes a vessel. He, he's creating, he's using these things to form you into the image of his son. You can be confident that if you're a servant of the Lord, that in the end, you win. That in the end, you win because Jesus won. That in the end, God's purposes for your life, his promises for your life will be fulfilled. That those things that are formed against you won't succeed. Notice the specific weapon mentioned here, the tongue. The tongue can do a lot of damage. James wrote about it in James chapter 3. Words hurt. Once people say something, you can't take it back. As much as you say, I'm sorry, I won't say that, I'm, I didn't mean that, once you speak it, damage comes. And people can use their words to accuse and judge and slander. But those who speak against you will ultimately be condemned because the Lord will be our defense and our defender. In Zechariah chapter 3, there's a wonderful picture of this. Zechariah 3, verses 1 to 5. Listen to the words, Zechariah 3, 1 to 5. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to oppose him, there to accuse him. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments, and he was standing before the angel. And then he answered and spoke to those who stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And to him he say, See, I have removed your iniquity from you, and I will clothe you with rich robes. And I said, Let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head, and they put clothes on him, and the angel of the Lord stood by. Look, the devil is an accuser of the brethren. He loves to point out our failures. He loves to point out our faults. He loves to point out the issues in our lives that aren't right. He even lies about the issues in our lives. He's a slanderer. But as all that is going on, the Lord is our defense. He says, put clean clothes on him. That he clothes us with the righteousness of Christ. He takes away the filth. He gives us a clean standing so that no accusation no accusation is valid because we've been received the righteousness of Christ. Romans chapter five, 8 and verse 1. Romans chapter 8 and verse 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. If you're a servant of the Lord, you are justified, you are forgiven, you are righteous, and no accusation will stand. You don't have to walk around feeling condemned because you're not. No weapon formed against you will prosper in the end, no matter what kind of accusations are levied against you by your enemy. The Lord has counted you righteous. You're safe. You're secure. Even as will be at the end of the millennial reign, as an attack is formed and God steps in and supernaturally delivers. Look, our security, our safety is in Him. He is able he will protect us. You can trust in him. And again, this is the heritage. If you're his servant, no weapon formed against you will prosper. No accusation. That's your heritage. If you're his servant. If you serve yourself, then this isn't yours. Salvation comes when a person believes in Jesus Christ and confesses him as Lord. Romans chapter 10, verse 9. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Jesus Christ is Lord. He is master over all. That's who he is. Believing him, 
And believing in him means you accept the truth about him. That he is Savior. That he is Lord. That he is the one that you look to, rely on, depend on, trust in, and submit your life to. It's a relationship. It's not just a statement, it's a relationship. He is Lord, which means I am his servant. And if he is Lord and you are his servant, then he says to you, I have a heritage for you. No weapon formed against you will prosper. If you're a servant, the good news is that tonight, if you haven't been a servant, you can become a servant. He'll never force you. We're all born serving ourselves, our desires, our wants. So it's a choice. When you come to know that there's one who can rule your life much better than you can. When you come to discover there's one much better to serve than serving yourself, you have an opportunity to choose, to turn. And his name is Jesus. You're either serving him, the Lord Jesus, or you're in rebellion. You're either for him, on his side, or you're against him. That's what scripture teaches. There's no middle ground. So it's your choice. He's been merciful. He's been gracious. And we're going to see his grace developed in the next chapter in an amazing way. That he's invited all to come, but you still have to make a choice to come. Tonight, if you've been listening and you realize that you're still in control, that you're still trying to run your own life, and you haven't become a servant, if you're listening and you realize I want to serve him. I want to trust in him. I want to have that security and peace and know that in the end, everything will be glorious. If that's you, um, you can come to him tonight and he'll forgive you. He'll accept you. He'll make you right. You know, often we invite people to receive him and that's what he does. He invites people to receive him. He knocks on the door and says, if you open the door, I'll come in and have a relationship with you. What's even more amazing to me is that he would receive me, that he would want me, that he would love me so much that he would die for me, and then he would make it so uh, free for me to come to him and to have a relationship with him and to experience his mercy and his love and his grace forever. For him to say, there's nothing for you to be ashamed of because it's all removed. For him to say, there's, there's nothing in your past that you have to worry about because it's all been forgiven. For him to say that your failures, well, I worked even in them and even through them and see what I've done. To, to know that, that he's just so gracious and so kind and so loving and he wants to give us this place with him forever. It's amazing to me. Because again, I'm not worthy. Uh, tonight it's true that you can become his servant if you'll believe, if you'll confess, if you'll acknowledge that he truly is the Lord. It can begin tonight as you pray something like this. Lord, forgive me. I've been serving myself. You are my Lord. I want to serve you. I believe that you died and you rose again. Come into my life. Be the Lord of my life. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And if you come like that with simple faith, he will forgive you, he'll accept you, he'll make you his. If tonight you're making that decision to begin to follow Jesus, we want to help you in this process. In the moment that you come to him, you're forgiven. But it's a relationship, so it's important to get to know him and to grow with him. And we have information that we'd like to give you to help you as you begin your walk with him. And we've, in this uh, time where we're meeting online and we're not able to see each other face to face, we want to make it as easy as possible for you to get information that will help you in your spiritual growth. So if you take your phone and you text to 717-456-7600, you text the word follow, 717-456-7600, just text follow. We'll send you a text right away and say, hey, what's your name? And then as you respond, uh, we'll send you another text that will give you a link to go to a website 
that will answer questions and give you some information that will help you as you start your relationship with the Lord. So please do that. Uh, we want to know if you've responded. We want to be able to pray for you. If you have questions, if you need prayer, uh, if you need help, you need somebody to listen to you and help you, uh, please contact us here at the church. Call us. We have someone answering the phone tonight. Or text us or send us an email. And we want to help you. We want to help you get to know our Lord and his word. So please do that. If you made that decision tonight, welcome to God's family. Uh, let's all pray. Let's give him thanks for what he said to us in his word. Thank you, Lord, for tonight. Thank you for this time in your word. Thank you, Lord, for your assurances. Thank you for your encouragement. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to see things from your perspective, uh, to be able to see from an eternal perspective, and to walk with that kind of confidence and joy. Thank you, Lord, that every trial, every hardship for us as believers is momentary. And then we'll have eternal blessing and eternal good and eternal reward. We're so thankful that we have that assurance. And Lord, for those that, that don't, uh, that all they have is this life, we pray, Lord, that you would continue to work in them, that they won't experience eternal suffering and regret. So thank you, Lord, for the time that you've given us. And I pray that you would equip us to be able to share clearly your truth with the world around us. We thank you. We praise you. We worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, thank you for being with us tonight. If you have questions, you need more information, please email us here at the church. Let's conclude our time together as we worship the Lord and give him thanks again in song.
things like you do. Yes, Lord, please give us vision. Please help us to see things the way that you do. Thank you for this time that we've had to learn from you. I pray that you would continue to impact our lives, that we would continue to walk with you. Please let us be lights to the world around us. Please bless our weeks. In your name, amen.